climbing into the exalted realms of consciousness. These are realms of the Brahma Devas, and the consciousness here is very refined and significantly different than the sensuous heavens. Mm. So these, and they're called the Brahma realms, Brahma Viharas. Now um, Brahma Vihara is the, is, are the contemplations of Metta and mm -hmm. Karuna and so on. And so these are so Brahma Loka. Brahma Loka, yeah. yes. Yeah, so describe a little bit about them. Um, well, the first principle to bear in mind is that this is an entirely different plane of consciousness. That the devas we discussed before, the sensuous devas, are actually closer in their nature of their being and their state of mind to us mm -hmm. than we are or they are to the brahmas. This is an entirely new plane of being. And it's called the, the rupa plane, <coughs> the, the plane of form, to distinguish it from yet another plane, the formless, mm -hmm. the, which are mind-only beings. The, the brahmas do have bodies. Sometimes you see in English, um, they're called the fine material plane. That's mm -hmm. a very loose translation, but it does have a, a point that um, they do have bodies, but they're much more subtle. Mm -hmm. so it's a different sort of matter. They're, they're a ref very uh, subtle form that is not visible even to the Dewas unless they choose to manifest what's called a coarse body, a gross mm -hmm. body. They can choose to do that and then they can manifest to the Dewas. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. normally they're <clears throat> visible even to the Dewas. And they exist, the Brahmas exist in, there's a quite a actually complicated a hierarchy, but it could be simplified to say there's uh, four levels equivalent to the four jhanas. Mm -hmm. And their state of consciousness, their normal default mode of consciousness is equivalent to um, being in jhana. So it's a form of extended ecstasy. Yes. The ecstasy yeah. of jhana. Sometimes uh, people understand jhana as a kind of a anesthetized kind of state, but actually, at least in the first three jhanas, there's a quality of, of joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and even the last, the fourth jhana with equanimity is is a very refined form of ease and joy. So mm -hmm. these, they're in a, in a very heightened state of... And the lifespans in that era, in that realm the lifespans are very, very long. They're longer than, um, at least for the second and higher levels, they're longer than an entire world age. Uh, yes. They uh, exist in a high plane where they can contemplate the worlds below, the Chakawalas, the, this world of humans and Dewas. Mm -hmm. They can contemplate thousands of them below them. Yeah like a man holding sesame seeds in the palm of his hand. So I like to make this point when I'm teaching about uh, samatha meditation, mm -hmm. that it's not a narrow little mind. It's not a vast, narrow, expansive yeah. mind, like the mind of a Brahman takes in thousands of world systems. Right. Yeah. So it's closer to the Hubble telescope than it is to a laser yes. pointer. <laughs> yes. It's not a laser pointer, it's the Hubble. <coughs> it's the vision of the universe through the Hubble telescope. Yes vast galaxies yeah like dust in the sky yeah. yeah yeah so very helpful because it tells you a little bit about the the way if you if you're misdirected to a narrow pointed kind of concentration to begin with you're looking for the wrong thing mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. Maybe it's closer to what we would call focusing a telescope, like the lucidity and the focus, mm -hmm. yeah. rather than any kind yeah. of laser-like pointing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the this uh, descriptions of the Brahma realms, uh, you were saying, are helpful to the idea of samatha meditation, samadhi, or jhana meditation, that the, the very descriptions themselves kind of induce a sense of that cosmic ease. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's very good, you know, yeah. to be talked into it. Instead yes. Of sat down in an uncomfortable room and said, concentrate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is for those who are watching <clears throat> who want to practice this 
jhana meditation, it might profit you to uh, listen to descriptions or read descriptions of the Brahma realms, mm-hmm. which are said to be the resultant of the practice of, of jhana. Mm-hmm. Another, another relevant point in that regard is that uh, entering into jhana, one uh, is transcending or leaving behind uh, the sense sphere. Mm-hmm. And this is the nature of the Brahman, Brahmas, that they are an, increasingly, as you advance through the jhana realms, they're increasingly divorced from our ordinary sense experience. Even at the lowest level, um, they 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 don't have um, the vision into genders. There's no male or female known there. They're all just reckoned as beings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they don't have any sexuality. And they don't eat ordinary food. Even the, the dewas consume, you know, very refined dewa food. But the Brahmins, uh, Brahmas only feed internally on bliss. Ah. They feed on bliss. Yes, yeah. it's a bit disturbing to have to deal with food, isn't it? Yes. You know? Yeah. I think, you know, when, when people are really interested in something, they will often forget to eat. Also children, yeah. when they're engaged in play, they really don't want to come in and eat. You know, your mother's yeah. calling you, but you just don't want to be bothered with food. Yeah. So it's an interesting that, that uh, food, which is a, a sensuous pleasure, but of course is necessary, but it is... Uh, and of course the other end is excretion. Yeah, excretion. <laughs> so yeah, you don't want to be bothered with that when you're in the... And these divine ecstasies that are lasting eons, you know. Oh. So the, <clears throat> the the name Brahman or Brahma, mm. Brahma Loka, <clears throat> is not invented by the Buddha. It's not a new word, yeah. but he redefines it in some way, doesn't he? Yes. It comes from a Sanskrit root that um, uh, was related to the verb to be or to... Uh, uh, to grow, or and baba, or yeah, it's yeah. that's from the same root, like to cultivate, yeah, to, to become. Yes, <clears throat> yes, and um, uh, there is in a non-Buddhist usage, there's a difference between Brahman, which is neuter, mm-hmm. and Brahma, which is masculine, mm-hmm. representing uh, Brahman was a considered um, not a being so much as a, like a cosmic principle. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and Brahma was kind of like the anthropomorphic manifestation of that, mm-hmm. like the supreme being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we still see a trace of that in the etymology of the, the word in, in Pali. The word Brahma is though it's a um, masculine noun, it is uh, declined in with some neuter forms, mm-hmm. so it's kind of a indeterminate whether it's masculine or neuter. So Brahma, him, he or it itself, yeah. um, they have they're kind of advanced. Christianity is sort of now saying God and whatever she looks like, you know, yeah, that sort of thing, yeah. or whatever it looks like. So they're kind of ahead of the curve with this. Not genderizing too much the, yeah. the the Brahma, yeah, and Brahma in the previous sort of um, periods, the Vedic periods or Upanishads, perhaps, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. is a deity and something like perhaps the Yawa, um, uh, yeah. Yehovah, or whatever yeah. it is. Uh, yeah, well, it's a later. It's a bit later. It doesn't the uh, Brahma. Uh, as an entity or as a being does not appear anywhere in the Vedas. It mm-hmm. first appears in the Upanishads. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, it's difficult to know uh, historically at what point it became considered the supreme being. Mm-hmm. But it, it's very likely that was before the Buddha because we have references within the Buddhist canon of uh, when um, non-Buddhists are either de- being addressed or describing their own beliefs, that they, they seem to take uh, Brahma as a supreme being right. and as the creator. Well, let's talk about uh, the Buddhist uh, flipping of the universe uh, 
uh, regarding Brahma and the description of Brahma, uh, what, that Brahma himself or itself presumes to be the creator, mm. creator God. Yes. But Buddha is, um, begs to differ. On yes, that. yeah, that's a very important and significant um, uh, insight, which is the, the Buddhist <coughs> explanation of how monotheism comes to be. Mm -hmm. as a belief system. At the beginning of a new world system, as the world cycles through creation and destruction, at the beginning of a new world system, uh, a Maha Brahma, a great Brahma will appear alone. This is first jhana level. Brahma will appear alone in a palace mm -hmm. as the first being in that level. <clears throat> and after <laughs> some long period of time, by the force of their own karma, other beings will appear as lesser Brahmas in his retinue. And he has the belief, because he wished for company, he has the belief that he created them by his wish. Mm -hmm. And then he, t and they believe it when he tells them that. So they worship him. Yes. And so he, he then uh, has an increasingly large retinue of these lesser Brahmas that worship him. Mm -hmm. And he's the supreme being of that that level. And then he sees the the earth and the other realms lower than him, and he convinces himself he created them too. Mm -hmm. And he's the overlord of everything. Mm -hmm. And then when one of these lesser Brahmas' lifespan expires, they and they die and from that realm, they reappear on earth. And if they become an ascetic and they have visions of their previous life which they interpret as visions of heaven and the Supreme Being. Yes. And then they teach that. And, and that there is of... the Supreme Being which created these be all the beings. Yes. And uh, it's just a basic mistake of memory. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's just sincere. It's, there's no attempt to deceive. The Brahma is, is deduced this. And mm -hmm. in some ways, Buddhism has some doubt about the validity of reasoning processes and deductions because you can just be wrong yes the, the assumptions yeah. that are made yeah the whole history of western thought and I'll call, even in science of course that we we keep making wrong assumptions mm -hmm. and we develop theories out of these wrong basic assumptions um there is a there was a presumed to be a kind of medium which light traveled through mm. Yeah. Uh, which physicists uh, assumed to be there and worked with it, and then it was discovered that there is no such mm -hmm. thing, and it's not necessary to provide it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and at its time, it was not an unreasonable yes. view. It was based on actual reasoning from evidence. Yes. So. And you were once telling a story about the, I think it was the French Academy that was trying to estimate the how long the sun would last. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, they had based it on the idea that the sun was a lump of coal burning and that it would burn for a certain length of time. So they probably had it correct that if it was coal, yeah. it would burn. And But yeah. they would, they knew of no other hotter fire than coal. So, yes. But the actual calculations would be off by yeah. exponential factors. Yeah, and, and this not. caused, in the 19th century, this caused... Um, uh, a split between the geologists and the astrophysicists because they, you know, the, the astrophysicists had this idea the universe can only last so many hundreds of thousands of years and the geologists yes. were saying, well, we have rocks that are hundreds of millions of years old. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, that comes up in Buddhism and uh, is that you, you can just be wildly wrong. And science almost is proud of the fact that, yes, of course, we're wrong all the time, but we are allowed to correct it. Mm. Well, that's very nice, but it's uh, it's not very comforting to be wrong and not know it, mm. and uh, to presume yeah. and base a lot of very important decisions on wrong information. Yes. And the, the idea that it's a self-correcting system may be uh, wonderfully... Um, Maybe proud scientists are proud of that, but it's this life is going by, and we have to make some very important existential 
mm -hmm. choices. Mm -hmm. And it could be based on wrong deduction. Yeah. So there, there is a story of the Buddha going to meet with one of these Brahmas, yes. Baka, because the Buddha had, of course, he had with his Buddha um, knowledge, he had a memory of his all his past lives. Mm -hmm. He had a deep personal connection with this Brahman, mm -hmm. this Brahma, when they they were both humans at um, aeons ago, and the Buddha had and had actually been at one point. Uh, the student of, of this Brahma in his human form mm -hmm. when he was a, a great ascetic. And he had attained with his ascetic power the ability to be reborn. He had deep mastery of fourth jhana and he was reborn in the highest Brahma world. And as aeons of time went by, he fell from that down to eventually to the first level Brahma world. And he was the first one to appear in the in the cycle, just mm -hmm. as explained before. And the Buddha saw that he'd fall into this del delusion, so he wanted to help correct his view. <coughs> so he went up to that realm. Mm -hmm. And there's some comic touches in the story. Like when the Buddha appears in that realm, his the, this Brahma's disciples, it says that their mind was occupied by Mara. And so they challenged the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And they said, you should bow, uh, Samana, you should bow before this great Lord or you will be reborn as a, as a, in a stunted dwarfish form mm -hmm. as punishment. You know, you have to show respect to this Lord. And, and um, Baka himself then lists out his, his epithets. I am Baka, I am the Mahabrahma. I am the overlord, I am the creator, I am the all victorious. <laughs> right? It's like, I am the great and mighty Oz, don't look behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, Buddha is, the Buddha, of course, is like, uh, be that as it may. You know, and, he, and he starts, and he tells the, the Brahma, you are not supreme in the universe. There are these other levels above you that you know nothing of. <laughs> and uh, that... The Brahma is not at first convinced, and there's some argument, and then the <coughs> Baka, the Brahma, challenges the Buddha to see who is the more powerful. I can disappear from your sight, you can disappear from mine. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the, Bra the Brahma cannot disappear from the Buddha, mm -hmm. but the Buddha can disappear from his sight simply mm -hmm. by transferring himself up to the second mm -hmm. jhana level, right. which this one has no conception of. And the commentary goes goes into um, that's from the sutta, and in the commentary goes into uh, a little more detail of how the the Brahma tried to disappear. <coughs> he says at first he uh, reverted to his natural state rather than have assumed like a created body that that a human could see. He reverted to his natural state, and the Buddha could still see him. And then he created a great pall of darkness, and the Buddha uh, dispersed that with a brilliant light. Mm -hmm. And finally, in despair, he ran from his palace and hid behind a tree. <laughs> <laughs> and and his, uh, his followers all, <coughs> all mocked him. You know? Is that you, great Brahma, squatting behind the tree? <laughs> <laughs> and this is really about uh, levels of knowledge, isn't it? That the higher levels of knowledge are it just not known to one until you that realm is open to you. Mm -hmm. So we learn uh, addition and subtraction, but we don't know multiplication. Mm -hmm. Now we learn multiplication, but we don't know algebra, and we don't know trigonometry, we don't know calculus. Yeah. And these realms, how they would calculate these things would be because hidden knowledge, mm -hmm. but the lower knowledges would be um, obvious to one who has higher knowledges. Yes. So this is uh, this happens again in the history of science. Uh, you have Lord Kelvin, the which you you know gives his name to the scale of uh, temperature scale. <clears throat> He's the foremost uh, physicist about the age of the Earth. Mm. And he's got it somewhere in the 20 million range. And this is in the early 1900s. Mm. And then 
they start to see the 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 process of nuclear um, decay, and they realize that the Earth is probably between two and three billion years old. And a, a young physicist has to go to the conference. Kelvin is 90 years old by that time, the most esteemed physicist, and he's sitting in the front row. Mm. And this physicist who's 25 has to get up and say that the age of the Earth now um, is mm. about probably between two and three billion years old. And Lord Kelvin is sitting there at 90, the most esteemed physicist in the world, smiling benignly at the ignorance of this <laughs> <laughs> upstart. <laughs> yeah. So it, it jumped, you know, exponential factors just like mm. that. Mm. And of course that didn't, you know, I've discovered that the sort of the last best estimate of the age of the earth was somewhere around 2005, mm. um, the year 2005 something like 4.38 billion years. Uh, but they really needed material from the moon in order to really pin it down. But, you know, just in the last decade or so, we've mm. kind of narrowed it to a <laughs> that recent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So these are forms of knowledge and lack of knowledge. And the Buddha is, is uh, uh, trying to inform uh, the, the society and the structures of the time about this much more expanded and mm. universe that people a universe within consciousness so yeah. talk about a little relationship between how do these brahma uh, how do the brahmas arise what is the cause in in the in the buddhist mm. explanation what is the cause of this uh, well the you know, on a personal level the entry into the brahma realm is jhana one who has the mastery of jhana can be reborn into the brahma realm um, on a cosmological level, the, uh, it represents a plane of existence higher than the sensual sphere. And when the worlds are, world systems are, de are destroyed and new ones arise, the Brahma realms are the last to go and the first to appear. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a, uh, there's a very complex um, cycling. There's, uh, the world is, is, can be destroyed by fire, water, or wind. Mm -hmm. And destruction by fire destroys everything up to the first Brahma level. Mm -hmm. Dest and that happens um, 15 times. And then on the 16th time, the destruction is by... Um, uh, by water, and that destroys everything up to the second jhana level. And then there's 15 of those cycles, um, you know, with fire and and, wa and water. Then uh, on the 64th time, there's destruction by wind. <laughs> that destroys everything up to third jhana yeah. level. And there, there's a relation of that to the jhanas that in um, the uh, one uh, ancient text makes the, makes explicit that destruction by fire is like uh, uh, thought, mm -hmm. and thought uh, ceases at first jhana level. That's at the last level in which there's any thought formation. Mm -hmm. uh, water is like um, uh, piti, rapture, mm -hmm. and that that reaches up to second jhana level. That's mm -hmm. the last place that occurs. And mm -hmm. then um, the wind is like breath. Mm -hmm. And breath is supposed to cease altogether in fourth jhana. Mm -hmm. So the last place it occurs is in the... Yeah, it's the very, very clever. I mean, the, the, uh, I come across these explanations and it's yeah. just <laughs> marvelous how they work these things. Yeah, out, yes. So. yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, but of course, I mean, the, the basic is that the the cause of appearing in these Brahma realms is is jhana itself? Yes. Um, so they're not they're not simply spontaneous or not appearing out of nowhere or not created by a, a deity. No, they're reborn. But they're they're born there. Beings that were reborn yeah. into that realm, right. usually from the human realm, having attained to jhana. Yes. 
So that, that makes a, a very distinct and clear causal link between these realms and human consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, the um, first jhana level is uh, the only one where we have names of individual Brahmas and stories about them. Mm -hmm. And there's you know several stories that involve Brahmas, like Brahma Sahampati coming to see the Buddha and urging him to teach. Mm -hmm. These are all first jhana level Brahmas yes. <clears throat> because thought formation uh, only exists up to first jhana. Mm -hmm. So the second, third, and fourth jhana Bra Brahmas, we don't ha have we don't distinguish them as individuals and. They'd have no stories about them doing anything because yeah. they're just blissed out all the time. Right. <laughs> there's not there's not any activity, discursive activity going uh -huh. on. They're just in a state of suspended bliss. Yes, yeah. yes. Let's go to the this realm of the of non perception, the mm. asanya asanya satta realm. Yeah. yeah, this is a curious corner of the cosmos. It's it's. Um, in the mapping of the cosmos is put in um, uh, the, the level with the fourth jhana of beings, but it isn't really fourth jhana. It, um, it's said to be uh, heretics or non-Buddhists, that uh, meditators who came to the conclusion that consciousness and perception are the cause of all suffering and you should eliminate that factors, those factors, mm -hmm. until they develop a kind of um, uh, self-anesthetic, you know, in, their, in mm -hmm. their meditation. And they're reborn into this realm where they appear from the outside as beautiful statues sitting in chairs, and they persist for hundreds of kappas of time mm -hmm. without a single moment of consciousness. And the first time consciousness arises, they cease to exist in that realm, and they appear, some, you know, some lower realm. Right. So they theoretically or objectively have been existing for this enormous length of time, but there's no experience of it. No. So no. They, they, the last moment of the previous life and the first moment of this life are next to each other. Yes, and it's a, that's actually discussed in the commentary. as it's, it's an interesting reflection on the nature of time and the nature of consciousness. It says how because the in the ordinary run of things, mm -hmm. each moment of consciousness is is a proximity cause for the following moment, mm -hmm. so that it can be visualized like falling dominoes. One consciousness arises and then the next mm -hmm. immediately after. But how could there exist a continuity of consciousness with a gap of five hundred kappas of time? Mm -hmm. And it said that um, the gap of time is irrelevant. The continuity is unbroken, mm -hmm. and it's it's like the implication is that there's a continuity of moments in the outer universe, and there's a continuity of moments of consciousness, and they're normally more or less synced. But it's possible for the continuity to continue even with this external break. I know. I remember the. I think it was the uh, analogy they made was a, a hunter is tracking a deer through the forest and he mm. follows the footsteps and then there's a large space of rock mm. where the, the footprints disappear mm. and he walks across the rock and he looks on the far edge and he finds the footprints mm. appear mm. so that this although the footprints disappear on this end and they appear on that end he he does not presume that there was no existence of the deer between the two yeah. so that very apt yeah, yeah. this mm. And they, they have such beautiful, <laughs> elegant yeah. similes and metaphors yeah. to them. <laughs> I think a good modern analog for this state is general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. If anyone has had a surgical procedure with general anesthesia, they know and understand this. You get <clears throat> the mask with the gas on your face and they tell you to count to 10 backwards yeah. and you go 10, 9, 8, 7, and then you open your eyes and you're in the recovery room. Yeah. And it's a quite different experience from deep sleep because mm -hmm. when you're asleep, no matter how deeply you sleep or how long, when you wake up, there's a sense of time having passed, mm -hmm. even though you don't remember any of it. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of time having passed, but that's completely gone with general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. It's like the moment in the operating room is followed by the moment in the recovery room. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and then you ask, when does the operation take place? <laughs> oh, oh, that's all over, dear. <laughs> Would you like some ice cream? <laughs> so any other corners of the Brahma realm that you'd like to talk about? Uh, well, we should mention the, um, the higher Brahma levels. Mm -hmm. The, the, because this is also contemplating the details of these higher Brahma levels is also very informative for one trying to develop jhanas. The comparison between the different levels <clears throat> already mentioned that there's no thought formation in first jhana. Now it said that the most beautiful sight in the universe is a, a Maha Brahma sitting in his palace. Mm. Then in the second jhana level is equivalent to second jhana, and it said the most beautiful sound in the universe is heard in this level, yeah. because the Brahmas are all the time crying out, oh, ho, sukho, oh, mm. oh, the bliss, oh, the bliss. They're, oh, the bliss, yes. they're, they're uh, overwhelmed with the sukha, or, and the piti and sukha, mm. and piti is very thrilling and exciting, mm. and it said that their, <coughs> their radiance flickers like a torch. And then the third jhana level, is said to be the greatest happiness in the universe, but it's silent hmm. because they are experiencing only bliss without rapture, uh -huh. sukha only. So it's a more peaceful, oceanic kind of experience without the thrilling aspect. So their radiance is said to be steady like the light of the moon. Hmm. It doesn't flicker like a torch. Hmm. Um, and the fourth Brahma level is the uh, level of great fruit, uh, weapon. Uh, Wehapala level, mm -hmm. where equanimity is the dominant factor, and so they're in a state of profound peace. And their their realm is not um, destroyed at the end of a universe. And this gets discussed too, and uh, in one of the texts, one of the later texts, says, asking the question, does this violate the law of impermanence? Mm -hmm. And it said, no, it isn't, because it's only by a convention that we even consider it a realm. It's a, it, it's not a place. It's like each individual Brahma existing there is, you know, his own entity. It's not the other, the lower realms. There's like a structure, right. like they have a, a a ground, a jeweled plane. Right. So, so a jeweled plane, and they have <coughs> dwelling places. But the we have Pala Brahmas are like in a state of individual seclusion and bliss. Yeah. Right, the, the boundaries of the body are kind of vague, there's no real sense of, the, of a body or a place for a body. Yes, and this is parallel to what we discussed before with the sensual realm, how sensuality becomes increasingly subtilized, and mm -hmm. then you make the, the leap into the non-sensual level of the Brahmas. Yes. Likewise, in the Brahma realms, you, the physical form is increasingly subtilized. Mm -hmm. And then the level beyond the fourth um, fourth jhana level is the realm of the formless, <coughs> where they have no bodies at all. It's a yes. mind only. Right. Yeah. So you see this beautiful uh, orderliness and symmetry and exquisite, uh, exquisitely beautiful thought processes to shape this gradual transition up the scale of sensuous happiness, subtle, sophisticated, profound, right off the end into the Rupa jhanas and the uh, Brahma Lokas and this the body becoming fading, fading, and the also the quality from joy fading into equanimity. Mm -hmm. And then it just goes right off the scale into these, these Arupa mm -hmm. uh, levels. There's also one more, uh, for we should mention for sake of completion, there's one more like, slot in there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the Sudawasas, the um, uh, pure lands, mm -hmm. the pure lands where Anagamis go. Yes. Uh, which is also technically classed in the fourth jhana level. And uh, these are the, the, at the very summit of corporeal existence. There's nothing, mm -hmm. you know, so the highest one is called Akanita, which is like the, the summit, the peak. It's like the, the peak of the whole universe. Um, 
these ananagami is one who has attained to the third level of awakening so they've uh, overcome the lower fetters but they still have the su subtle desire for becoming mm -hmm. so having destroyed the uh, root of sensual desire there's impossible for them to be reborn in the sensual desire realm anymore mm -hmm. there's no energy there mm -hmm. for that to occur but they still have the desire to be so they have to appear somewhere mm -hmm. and there's these um, five levels of the pure abodes where they exist in a state of great subtlety and happiness until they become our hunts and cease to be reborn altogether mm -hmm. yeah yeah what a what a journey through the universe it has been mm -hmm. so that's the rather brief um description of these immense stations of consciousness and their manifestations as uh, realms of existence and the incredible uh, descriptions of these in the Buddhist suttas and also in the commentaries. So yes, we would appreciate that, the amount of uh, study that goes into this and the articulation of this as well.